Venga la va. Ok. Me cago la. Ok. Tu hay ahora Wanda Bade. So, so this morning we have uh, a very, uh, very good, very important lesson, or I, lesson is the wrong word, teaching on New Testament theology amid persecution and suffering. And so uh, I think it should be obvious to say this is, I think, especially relevant for our context here in Myanmar. And so I, I hope that you will uh, give me your full attention and you will listen carefully as we look at the scripture text and uh, just engage in, in uh, everything we're doing today and to really, really look for some, some deeper understanding as to what Peter and John have to say about how to respond to persecution and how to respond to hostility from a non-believing, a non-Christian world. All right, let's begin and pray for this class. Dear gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the ways that you're part of our lives, for your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness to us, and for calling us in the midst of our suffering and darkness and difficulties to a brighter hope, to a better way. We pray now that you'll speak to us through scripture, through these, uh, these lectures, in ways that strengthen the students' understanding of these uh, books, but also equip them theologically to better support and guide the people of their churches. Uh, I ask a special prayer for my mother-in-law that she may die peacefully and uh, with a, a minimum of pain, and that your Holy Spirit will work in this, in our family in the midst of uh, a very difficult time of passage. And we pray for all of our students here, and especially those who are suffering in ways that we know or don't know, uh, that we may experience your grace and comfort and help. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's begin with, we're, we're going to look at First Peter, first of all, and then we're going to talk about the book of Revelation. Alright, so I'm putting up on the screen here, uh, the, the, the map of Paul's missionary journeys. Even though we're not talking about Paul today, but I'm, I, I'm putting this up here because this is the, the world of the New Testament. And so when we read 1 Peter, uh, or parts of 1 Peter, we're going to see that he's writing not to one church, but as far as we know to to. Jewish Christians, predominantly Jewish Christians as far as we know, who are scattered in this region here of Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, and Pontus. And so they're, they're up here, and I think even some in, in Phrygia. We'll, we can look here in a moment. Uh, but this is the region where uh, many of the, the Christians uh, were, and some of them may have been uh, converts from Paul's missionary work. Others may have fled from Jerusalem where, where there was a great persecution, as we read about in Acts. And so when the persecution came, the Christians scattered and they went throughout the world. And when they went throughout the world, they took the gospel with them. And so that's how churches began to spread and Christianity spread around the world, as well as through the work of the apostles. So that's our geographical context. And when we get to uh, Revelation, I'm going to show you uh, where the island of Patmos is on the map, but also uh, some pictures because I visited there uh, several years ago, and so I can show you a few pictures of what it looks like today. Alright, let's, let's turn to 1 Peter and let me, let me show you here. Let's, I'll put the text up here on the screen. All right, so you can see Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered. You know, exile somebody sent out. That's, that's what leads me to believe these may be people who came from Jerusalem. Exile, scattered. Scattered means spread. Throughout the provinces of Pontus, 
Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And those were the places I showed you on the map a few minutes ago. Uh, and, and Peter says, these are those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. All right, so there's, uh, there's so much just in these two verses. Uh, and I, we're going to come back to the, them later. Uh, but I just want you to notice, as, with, as is true with so many of the letters in the New Testament, uh, they are not just theological treatises. Rather, they are the writings of an apostle to real people. People with feelings, people with pain and suffering, people with questions, people with faith, people who are searching, uh, people who need guidance and shepherding. Frankly, they're people just like the people in your congregation. Now, maybe your people haven't been scattered, they're not exiles, uh, but they have many of their own burdens. And so as we read the text, uh, of course, in this class, we're focused mostly on the theological contact, content, content. But I also want to continually bring to your attention the pastoral concern of the writers of the New Testament. Because you're going to be in that role of pastors and ministers. And so notice how, how they write. And so here we see not only does he acknowledge their suffering by saying, you're exiles and you're scattered. So he sees them. That's what that means. He sees them. He see, and when we say we see somebody, that means we, we see them as they really are. We see them with their strengths and we see them with their weaknesses. We see them with their joys and we see them with their sorrows. And so important in pastoral ministry to see people for who they are. Not who you want them to be, but who are they? And then you bring God's word to that person. That's what Peter does. And in really a magnificent way. It's one of my favorite books of the whole New Testament. Because of that. Because of his ability to construct a letter that meets the needs of these people so well. Okay, now I'm going to step back from the text for a moment. And let's go to your lecture notes. Because I want to give you some more background uh, to, to one very important theological issue that both Peter and Revelation address. Uh, so I'm going to read th th this part of the lecture. This is, we're going to talk about now theological responses to the persecution of the first century. A, the historical context. Persecution of Christians in the first century A.D. Throughout the New Testament, there are, are many clear evidences that Christians were undergoing persecution and should expect persecution. The teachings in the Gospels and Acts, written between AD 85, 65 and 90, take for granted a continuous opposition and persecution. That's according to Leonard Goppelt. At first, Christianity was viewed by Rome as a Jewish sect. Consequently, it benefited from the same protection and exceptions allowed to it by Roman law. However, as it became increasingly clear that Christianity was not a Jewish sect, and due to the nature of the gospel and the implications of it, hostilities arose from various camps or various people. So B, theological responses to suffering. At the end of the first century, the authors of 1 Peter and Revelation offer two major theological responses to persecution in the New Testament. Let's start with Revelation, and then we'll come back to 1 Peter. In Revelation, persecution is inevitable and unavoidable. That means if you're a Christian, you will be persecuted. That was the point of view of the writer of Revelation. So what's his message? So endure and look for God's deliverance. The revelation belongs to the period of Domitian's rule. The portrayal of the beast uttering blasphemies and calling for worship possibly refers to the emperor Domitian. John reports at least one known martyr in Pergamum in 2.13. 
But the reference to the coming resurrection of martyrs who died because of their faithful witness surely indicates that others had died as well for their faith. At least, if nothing else, John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, expected further persecution and deaths. His vision would have been received by Christians who, along with him, perceived the threats of Rome as real and terrifying. Okay, so that's Revelation's approach, which we'll come back to later, the second hour. Now let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter had a little different idea, all right, a little different perspective. So I'm asking you today to see the difference between John of Patmos' response to persecution and Peter's. The oppression of 1 Peter appears to refer to that incurred from the pagan society. What does pagan mean? Pagan refers to the polytheists, those who believed in many gods. The polytheists, and often they were from the countryside. So these polytheists, and while Revelation clearly has political rulers in Rome in mind, so two different sources of persecution. First Peter recognized that Christians had provoked opposition by the removal of themselves from the usual pagan way of life. Some conflict with pagans was unavoidable. But at the same time, Peter urges Christians to be accommodating where possible. Do you know that word accommodating? English word? Accommodate? To accommodate means to make allowances for. And so, in other words, what he's saying is the Christians don't believe in the pagan festivals uh, just as I trust you don't believe in new moon festivals or full moon festivals and all the other um, Buddhist holidays here. Uh, so you are in a context where the dominant group has a worship rituals and holidays that you don't uh, you don't recognize or you don't believe in. Well, it was the same thing was true for early Christians. So what Peter is saying is he doesn't expect them to believe something that they they don't believe, but he, but if they can be accommodating. If they can find a bridge to build toward these people, if, if they can go along with some things, uh, they should. The question always is, what? How far do they go along with things? Um, do they worship their gods? Well, no, never, never. But how could they accommodate or how could they uh, you know, make friends with or, or try to develop good relationships with the non-Christian neighbors. Thus Peter urges Christians to maintain good conduct among the Gentiles and to be subject to every institution including the emperor, governors, masters for slaves and husbands for wives. That was the way. That's how you could accommodate the pagans. You could recognize that they value uh, good conduct, they value submission to authority, and so the Christians should cooperate with that, is what Peter is saying. This teaching was not contrived to appease the pagans. Appease means to try to please them. He didn't make this up just to try to please the pagans. Since the author of 1 Peter was clearly against any conformity or compromise that would violate the Christian values. However, since moral, traditional living was simultaneously appropriate for Christians and for pagans, Peter brings up these issues in order to help the Christians avoid any unnecessary persecution. Underline the word unnecessary. Okay, that, that's the main difference between Peter and Revelation. Peter thinks some of the persecution you're experiencing is not necessary. You don't have to be experiencing this persecution. You can change it. So that's what's different. Revelation never talks like that. He assumes all persecution is unavoidable. In addition, adherence to these mutual values would serve the purpose of witness. So underline the word witness in your guide. Underline witness. 
Uh, because that also is, is uh, a, a distinctive feature of 1 Peter. Which was another important priority for the Christian in this epistle. Finally, where suffering was unavoidable, Peter sought to interpret their experiences positively. That is, as a blessing, a cause for rejoicing, and sharing in Christ's suffering, etc. All right, so that's the overview of two approaches to persecution, two different kinds of persecution, some different reasons for persecution. And that requires for a different, two different perspectives on persecution. So now, let's talk about Peter itself, the book itself. Fourfold purpose of Peter. Peter wrote to help the community define itself as a household of God. Different from, but not inferior to non-believing neighbors who may have had a higher social status. A second purpose is to help Christians avoid unnecessary persecution. A third purpose is to teach Christians to serve as a witness in the world by living orderly lives, following the customs of the society where they don't, do not conflict with God's ways. For example, as I already said, submission to authorities, order in the home, and by doing good deeds. And then fourthly, the fourth purpose is to reinterpret positively the, the suffering they could not avoid. That is, interpret it as a blessing and as a cause for rejoicing because they were sharing in Christ's suffering. So those are the four purposes that I see in the book of uh, 1 Peter. If you go on to do research in 1 Peter, not every commentary will have these four purposes. They may have one or two or three of them. But I, after my study of 1 Peter, I'm convinced that there, there are at least four purposes to this book. Roman numeral number three. Peter's teaching for Christian living in a hostile, pluralistic context. Peter contextualizes Paul's teaching on growing in Christ for Christians who were marginalized by the broader, religiously pluralistic society and sometimes even persecuted for their faith. All right, that's a long sentence, but it's very relevant to our class. Okay, Peter uses Paul. As far as we can tell, Peter's theology comes largely from Paul. They're not in disagreement. They're in agreement. But Peter contextualizes. What, in, in this new version of New Testament theology, I, I've tried to bring out every, in every book Anytime I can identify how the author is contextualizing their message. Because I'm hoping that's going to help you think about how you're going to contextualize your message. So, again, what we mean by that is Peter has a gospel message. He has a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's experienced the Holy Spirit. But now he needs to take this message and apply it to his context. And so what I'm pointing out here is that the context is one of a group of people who are marginalized by the broader religiously pluralistic society. Now do you think that might be relevant here in Myanmar? Yes or no? Yes? Or, yes, thank you. Good. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, this is why I think this is one of the most important books for, for our class. It's because he is, he is giving to us his response to people who are in a situation that's in some ways similar to your own. In the face of such hardship and danger, he urged Christian believers to go deeper into their own relationship with God in Christ. To strengthen their self-understanding as the people of God and to prepare themselves intellectually as well as spiritually, morally, and behaviorally so their witness to the largely non-Christian neighbors would be more clear, vibrant, and persuasive. They were not to shy away from suffering for Christ. Yet at the same time, they should avoid unnecessary persecution, that which comes from outright rebellion or immoral behavior. And they should live exemplary lives for all to see. 
He urged them to live such good lives among the pagans. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Because that's Paul's, that's, excuse me, that's Peter's perspective on how they should respond. Let's go on. To live up to our calling and to the demands of serving Christ requires ongoing spiritual growth and development. So Peter says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That fits very well with our theme, doesn't it, for the year? Growing in Christ, preparing for service. And this is 1 Peter. It's all over 1 Peter. That's what he's telling them. You have to grow up in Christ. That prepares you for witness and prepares you for service. Peter writes elsewhere, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He knows well that his readers already have experienced the grace of God and know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Yet he also knows that the Christian faith calls us to keep growing in our knowledge and experience of God in ever new and more meaningful ways. Okay, so, so let me... I've given it the, the idea here in writing, but let me try just verbally to, to reiterate the main point. Let's say you are all of the, the people that Peter's writing to. All right, and you are scattered throughout those regions he wrote about. And right now you're, you're all together. So all the Christians are gathered in one room. But when you go home or you go back to your villages, you're going to be in the minority again. You're going to be surrounded by people who are sometimes hostile to you. Sometimes who discriminate against you. Sometimes who even persecute you. Uh, or, or perhaps they just look down at you, on you. And so what Peter would say to you is, he would say, there's a way for you to handle this challenge. And he's going to say many different things. But one of them is that you need to recognize that you are part of the family of God. So you look around to, at each other. You have brothers and sisters here. So even though you're marginalized by the majority group, you still have a family. You still belong. Right? So that's his first point. You are the family of God. So don't forget your identity. Second, he says... For you to be able to handle the challenges and the suffering, you need to get stronger. How do you get stronger? You need to grow in Christ. Keep, crave, crave spiritual growth. Seek after God. Develop a godly character, a godly mindset. Follow Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Do all that you can to keep growing in Christ. That will make you stronger. Thirdly, he says... And then when you're interacting with the people on the outside, think about how you are conducting yourselves. Don't be in rebellion. Don't, don't ignore their values. If there's something that you can do that would be respectable to them, do it. So do a good job. Work hard. Do good in society. They will respect that. So do it for their sake, if not for the sake of other people. And that way you will avoid unnecessary persecution. And you will also be a good witness to them. So that's what Peter's message basically is. You are the family of God, so be confident. Know who you are. Grow in Christ. Do what's right in society so that you don't get persecuted for the wrong reasons. And so that you can be a good witness. And then lastly, his message is, sometimes you're going to be persecuted anyway. Sometimes you're going to suffer. But don't be afraid. Don't think that something's wrong. Recognize that you are suffering as Jesus Christ suffered. And that you're sharing in his suffering. And that's a blessing. That's an honor. So that in, in just a few minutes, that's the collection of main messages of 1 Peter which I, I continue to believe is uh, extremely relevant to any group of people who feel marginalized or aren't sure how they're supposed to interact with a, 
a, a non-Christian majority culture. Okay, now we're going to look at some specific texts. So let's look, first of all, at 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 10. Okay, Jesus Bay. So now, you see in the verse 10 here, it says, Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Right? What does he mean, once you were not a people? They were people. They weren't aliens. They weren't dogs. What does he mean? Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. They were sinners. Okay. What else are you saying? See, what he's talking about is identity. And what he's really saying, he's not saying you were not human beings. But what he's saying is you were a collection of a lot of, a lot of different people. I mean, some of them were Jewish, but, but I think many of them were, were other than Jewish, uh, scattered throughout these regions, these uh, largely Gentile regions. And so they, were, they weren't pulled together as a people. They were individuals or other communities. But what he's saying is now you have a new identity. Because of your faith in Christ, you have a new identity. And that is your primary identity. And so, and, and how is he defining the, the, the changeover? Well, when they were not a people, they had not received mercy. But now that they are a people of God, they have received mercy. That's how you cross over from not a people to a people. It's by accepting Christ's sacrifice, putting your faith in Christ, receiving the mercy of God, so that you become children of God. That was Peter's theology. Well, this is extremely relevant, I think, in a country with 135 different ethnic groups. Because if I asked you, if I said Tubalumiole, I think some would say Chin, some would say Kachin, Wa, Kiyin, right, and uh, what, many others. I think Peter would say, now that you are believers, your whatever you were before that's less important than who you are now in Christ and so that your primary identity is now a follower of Jesus Christ you belong to Christ now this is very foreign to this me and my context in my experience because for many people they almost wear a badge on that uh, it's like I belong to this tribe I, you know, I belong to this ethnic group. And they're very protective about that identity. I'm not criticizing that. I understand that. Uh, my ancestors were French. So I used to run around my neighborhood in Chicago with a French flag. <laughs> Nobody liked that because there weren't any other French people. But I said, I'm French. And so I was proud of it. So I, of course you're proud of your, your ethnic heritage. But I had to learn, first of all, that I was now an American, so I probably should emphasize that more. So I had a, a national identity. But even more important than that, I was a Christian. And so since childhood, uh, when people ask me who I am, I say I'm a follower of Christ. That's my primary identity. That's what Peter is saying. It's not just a theological truth. It's a key for survival. It's a key for thriving in this world. To know who you are, to gather with others who share that faith, and then to be strong together. One of the things that breaks my heart is when I hear stories here on MIT campus of where different ethnic groups cluster together and mistreat somebody from a different ethnic group. They won't talk to that person. They won't include that person. They'll use their own language so they know the other person can understand it. They're not thinking about our common identity. They're thinking only about their, their own ethnic identity. And the result is sometimes very hurtful behavior. People are, are isolated, alienated, neglected. Well, that's not really the point of Peter, but it occurs to me to say it to you, that if that's you, Please think about who you really are. And when you exclude somebody from a different group, you're excluding a brother or sister in Christ. So you have to make a decision about where your, your real loyalty is going to be in the end. 
Peter says to all of us, Americans, Westerners, Easterners, no matter what, if you're a follower of Christ, Christ should take the first place for our identity. All right, so now let's go back to uh, 1 Peter. We'll go back and forth here, but let me go back to chapter 1 and those two verses we read earlier. Now please look at the notes that are in your guide. Perspectives on Christian identity. That's what I've been talking about, your identity, who you are. According to Peter and Paul, Christians are the elect. That means God chose you. You're elected by God. And, and point A here, election is for sanctification, which leads to or affects obedience and sprinkling of blood. Now that's very foreign to you and to me. What does he mean? Well, the sprinkling of blood is a metaphor from a religious rite in the Old Testament. After, after all Israel stood up and they, and they pledged allegiance to follow Yahweh, Moses would take some of the blood from the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the people. That was their ritual. Now, we don't do that today, but that was the ritual. But because Peter, as a Jewish uh, man, he, he knew the Jewish history, and this is what leads me to believe that there were many Jewish people in the congregation, he uses this metaphor because he knows they'll understand the idea of sprinkling with blood. It's a way of affirming the, the covenant. Thus the election of God of Christians is based on the Jewish covenant, whereby Yahweh initiates the relationship by choosing his people, who in turn were called to pledge their faith and obedience to him. Blood was used to ratify or seal the covenant. After the initial establishment of the covenant, blood was used to renew the covenant when there had been violations of it. Thus we can understand the connection between the shedding of blood and forgiveness and the New Testament concept of the blood of the covenant. All right, we talked about that a little bit when we talked about Hebrews. Uh, but, but this Peter is also using the same imagery because his context could understand this imagery. It's harder for us. So who were the recipients of Peter's letter? And how did it affect his theology? I've already told you some things about the marginalization and the being persecuted. But we can go deeper because scholars uh, have different opinions about who exactly these people are. So literally translated, Peter's readers were the alongside the people there or the resident aliens. In other words, they were people who lived in a certain place, but they were not given citizen status. All right, so they were living alongside. Well, who's like that in this country? The Rohingya, right? Right, so they live alongside, or they did, and they lived alongside of citizens, but they weren't citizens, could not be citizens. So that's just a modern day example of what it might be like. It, it could be, we don't know. But this one theory by this one scholar uh, who wrote Eliot, who, John Eliot, who wrote Home for the Homeless uh, many years ago, he suggested that they were resident, that means they lived there, but aliens. They weren't citizens. All right? So that's, that's this idea. And so John Eliot seizes upon the term to argue from a sociological perspective that Peter is addressing a certain underclass group, at least non-citizens in foreign countries. Eliot maintains that Peter was not alluding to an earthly pilgrimage. That was, that was the older view of what Peter meant, was that Christians are on a pilgrimage. Now, we'll, we'll look at that now. That, that is this idea of Lightfoot. These are scholars, Selwyn, and others argue that Peter's use of sojourners, that's the, the translation of the Greek word, and resident aliens or foreigners was metaphorical. In other words, it wasn't literal. Christians don't belong in this world. They are just passing through as travelers would. All right, so 
In other words, they might have been Christians. I mean, the Christians might have been citizens, but they don't really belong to the broader society, according to this view. So that could be more like Christians in Myanmar. So the first example is more like the Rohingya in Myanmar. The second example is more like the Christians in Myanmar. You're citizens, but you're marginalized. Or regardless of whether you're marginalized, I, I, I should say that differently. According to this theory, Peter is saying you should view yourselves as someone who doesn't fully belong to your own society. And we saw that in other books of, of the New Testament. So this is not a crazy idea. This could very well be what he had in mind. And this is an ongoing theological and practical question. What is the relationship of Christians to society? Right? Niebuhr wrote a book called Christ and Culture many years ago. How many of you have read Christ and Culture? Have, is that a requirement for this school? Oh, it should be. Because it, he gives four or five different ways Christians historically have related to culture. There's the Christ against culture view. There's the Christ with culture view. There's the Christ above culture view. There's the Christ transforms culture view. And different churches, different denominations have different ideas all taken from scripture as to how Christians should relate to their cultures. So that, that's a bigger subject than we can talk about here in depth. But I want to at least tell you that there's not one right answer. There are many churches, especially very conservative churches, that tend to be Christ against culture. It's like, no, the culture is dark, evil, it's wrong. Uh, we have nothing to do with that. We have to be in the light. All right? There are a lot of churches like that. The liberal church tends to be Christ with culture. All right? Because they, they, it's like, no, God works through culture, and we're part of culture, and we're supposed to be in culture, and God uses us in culture. And so you're going to get a lot of, of talk about, well, interfaith dialogue, social action. Let, let's be part of culture and make culture better. Okay? The inclusive view that you're familiar with might be closer to the Christ transforms culture. Or the Christ above culture. There's, there's two different ones. And that is, Christ is not really part of culture, but he's not against culture. But he calls us to, to know him and to work for the transformation of culture. Alright, so these are some different ideas. So what is Peter's view? Well, I'll let you decide. Uh, I don't think he's against culture. But he's not with culture either. His identity, he teaches our identity is separate from the broader culture. Our identity is in Christ. But what exactly is our role in society? When I look at 1 Peter, I don't really see that Peter believes that Christians can transform society. I don't see it. I see that he's teaching them to stand strong, to be a good witness, to be moral, to do good deeds. But I don't think he really believes that Christians can transform culture. He Rather, he's looking to Christ to return and to save his people. Uh, okay, so again, I'm, I'm trying to teach you about 1 Peter, but I'm also trying to get you to think about what is your view about how Christians should relate to culture? Because there are different ideas. And the, the answer you give will greatly affect how you relate to other people and how you pastor your church. All right. Point uh, three here. Thus there is an interpretive question. Are these Christians actually resident aliens? Or is this metaphorical language describing the nature of the Christian church? Or both? If it is the former, then this letter may speak more powerfully to those who feel marginalized by society. If it is the latter, it may be a word of challenge to those who might not see their call to be Christian witnesses in society. All right, I'm going to leave it at that and go on to, to point number two. Christian identity is rooted in the Trinity, 
Did you notice that here in verse 2? Yeah. You know, those who are critical of the doctrine of the Trinity say, you know, the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the New Testament. And they're right. It doesn't. But if you look at verses like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, very clearly in the early church, they believed in a role for God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. They didn't put them all together into one God. And they didn't subordinate two of them to the one God. They, they t Peter, for example, as did Paul, talk about the three side by side. Because of this witness in the New Testament, later church theologians developed the idea of the Trinity. But they didn't make it up from nowhere. It comes from Scripture, but it wasn't developed in Scripture. Alright, I think I'm just going to point that out to you. And let's talk about uh, Christian identity now. Uh, talk about, excuse me, ecclesiology and corporate Christian identity. So now I'm going to go back to chapter 2, nine and, verses 9 and 10. And those are the verses I, we started with a few minutes ago. But now I want to draw your attention to this list in verse 9 of all the different ways to characterize the people of God. All right, so, so tell me what are they? Give, give me one. Chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. Wow. I mean, mine says God's special possession. Other translations say, say a people belonging to God. Uh, but there's more. Because point five on the notes say these are people who have a purpose. Now what is that purpose? According to the end of verse 9, He called us that you may, you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. That's why in the Presbyterian uh, Westminster Catechism, they say what is the chief end of man or human beings? It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That was their answer to that basic question. What is your purpose? Well, according to the Presbyterians, they would say, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And this idea of glorifying God does appear over and over again in Scripture. And we've talked about it a little bit before. But this is something that I think, for me, is hard to understand. I, I feel like I do understand it better today, uh, but it's not natural to me. Because when I think about purpose of a people, I think, I think more practically. I think about, well, a family has a purpose of supporting each other, raising children, uh, surviving, uh, helping build society. I think about practical things. But Scripture continually calls us to say that as we're doing those things, our ultimate purpose is to bring glory to God. Again, for me, that's, that's hard for me to grasp. Now, maybe for you it's easy. Maybe for you it's easy. Uh, maybe, maybe it's my pride. Maybe that's my problem. I don't know my problem. But I have some problem with this. And not that I disagree, it's just that I know I have some resistance to it. So as I think about it and I pray about it, what comes to my mind is that as I focus my eyes on God, as I lift my eyes off of this world onto God, I understand, because He's my Creator, I understand better who I am. I understand why I exist, why I was created. When I take my eyes off of God and I look at myself or the world, part of me just wants to get everything I can for myself. You know, greedy, you know, grasping. I, I want things for myself. That, that's normal. Another part of me goes into despair because I see so much darkness and evil and I want to give up, I want to quit. And so, but both of those responses are not helpful to my life. They're not helpful to other people. Uh, and so whether it's a, a strong love of life and I want to grab it for all it can be worth or, or my discouragement, my skepticism and cynicism and despair makes me depressed, 
uh, that I, I, whatever, whichever way I might go, or just living life oblivious to any purpose at all, uh, none of those responses really brings out of me the life that God intends for me. The only thing that does that is when I turn my focus on to my Creator. And when I look at my Creator and I honor Him as a great Creator of this massive universe and the human race, my family and our love and all the things that we have, all the blessings, then my heart is full. I feel joy. I feel gladness. I feel hope. I feel as if I have purpose in this life. And I'm more willing to give up my selfishness. I'm less willing to, be, to go into despair. And I'm more willing to fight against the darkness. I'm more willing to hold up the light. And I think that is part of what this, the purpose behind the, this teaching is. It's to get us to lift our eyes off of ourselves onto God so that we can then live as God intended for us to live. That's the only way to come into the light. That's the only way to live by the light. Now I know very well there are, are atheists who try to produ produce good things in the world. I understand that. But I'm talking to you about the Christian perspective, the biblical perspective. That something is different when we turn our eyes to God and we live for God, not for ourselves. I think that is part of what's behind this verse. He says, God has created you as a people, but it's people with a purpose. But it's not a selfish purpose. It's to honor God. And when you honor God, God blesses you. So you're not going to be forgotten. It's just that God comes first. And then God blesses you. That's the Christian way. That's, what, that's what's behind Peter's theology. All right. Uh, and I already talked about point number six here, recipients of the mercy of God. Uh, what are the implications of this ecclesiology? Regardless of one's status in society, Christians are to view themselves as God views them. High status and significant role in this life. Comment on contextualizing. Peter drew from the thought world of ancient Judaism, covenant people, royal priesthood, chosen nation, and applied his inherited theological concepts to first, Christian, first century Christians, many of whom were Gentiles and many of whom were on the margins of Greco-Roman society. Peter created a picture of Christian identity that borrowed from the past and was at the same time contextually relevant to his readers. What do we call that? What is the word we, we introduce to you? That what, it, what do we call what Peter did? When he drew, he drew from the past, from ancient Israel, and he applied it, some of the same terms, but applied it to a new context. Somebody please tell me. Because the 14, of the 14 midterm papers I've graded so far, only one person got it right. <clears throat> what is this movement from the, the inherited theology to the application of the theology in the present context? It's called theologizing. Theologizing. So many of you, when you were answering, well, of the 14, 13 of 14 people, uh, when you were answering theologizing, <clears throat> I know where you got the answer. You went to a later part in the lecture where I talked about, where Dunn talks about theologizing today. So you were partly right. But you missed the main point. <laughs> the main point was the New Testament writers were theologizing in their day. They took from the old, but they, were, they added what they had in the past. They added to that Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And, to, to, and they took all that and it addressed the contemporary context. No longer just Jewish people. They were marginalized, scattered people in many cases. But that same theology could be applied. And that's exactly what Peter does here. That's why I don't want you to miss it. This is a great example of theologizing. Uh, to help illustrate that point that's hard to understand. Okay, let's, now we have to go quickly uh, through the rest. <coughs> 
called to maintain social order. Well, in chapters 2, 13 through 3, 7, we have a call to submission to rulers and masters and authorities and wives to submit to husbands. Thus, Peter is socially conservative. He places a higher value on witness to the non-believing society than on trying to change society. Now, some of you may want to ask questions about the role of masters and slaves, rulers and ruled uh, husbands and wives. So bring that up during our discussion session after chapel, if, if that's interesting to you. He talks about suffering for doing good. And then he also has a, a strong ethical section. Be holy, 113 to 2, 2. Now there's, he says, let's just look at, at, at those verses quickly. So this is, this is Peter's imperative. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So you see, what I said earlier, Peter believes the real hope is when Christ comes back. He doesn't really believe that Christians can transform society. They're not in any massive way. But rather, he was teaching them their real hope is later. But while, the, while you're here, while you're here, you have something to do. So at verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Alright, so you and I have a are called as Christians to live a certain kind of lifestyle, which Peter here is calling holiness, to live in holiness. Now, in your notes, I have, a, I have a, a comment. There are two meanings of holy for ancient Israel in the Old Testament. First of all, the covenant people who were set apart by God from their neighbors to worship and serve Yahweh. Alright, final section. Interpretation for today. Peter's teaching on how Christians should respond in the face of, of mar marginalization, misunderstanding, ignorance, and even persecution in a religiously pluralistic context was to neither hide from nor belligerently fight against those who oppose or mistreat them. He didn't advise them to change their theology or view themselves as inferior to the majority and the powerful. Instead, they should sharpen their self-understanding as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Then they should learn how to better reflect their faith, hope, and love to the non-Christians surrounding them in intelligent and in positive ways. In short, the best response for Christians in a hostile, religiously pluralistic setting is to keep growing in Christ and to better prepare to serve both within the church and within the broader society. And yes, I, I changed that last sentence to fit our theme for the year. Uh, but I did it on purpose because it's true, but I, I definitely worded it to fit our theme. Um, and that's what I've been talking to you about. Uh, Peter is telling us exactly this. B, Peter's message of hope to marginalized, persecuted minorities of the first century is a message of hope for today's marginalized, persecuted minorities. That, and that's, I take, took that from uh, the thesis of Biak Uklian, who graduated a couple years ago. I was his advisor, and uh, he wrote a, an excellent thesis on 1 Peter. Peter offered both a future and a present hope. The hope for the present was grounded in a proper understanding of their Christian identity in continuity with ancient Israel and grew out of their hope for the future. God will restore and deliver them. And finally, method, Peter reached back to the ancient Israel to cross out the word the. Uh, Peter reached back to ancient Israel experience in Israel's context and their theology to offer a message of hope in his own context. That's the theologizing I was talking about. How might interpreters of 1 Peter today 
utilize that same method to describe Christian identity and hope in their modern context. So that, this would be my dream come true. Are you listening? My dream for you is that you would take 1 Peter, this marvelous message of hope, and you would think, how can I teach this to my people at home? How can I, with continuity with Israel and continuity with the New Testament, because those are now your, that's your heritage, and now bring that to your current village, your, your church. How could you put together a message of hope for them? Hope for the present and hope for the future. Then you would be doing theologizing in your context based on the teaching of Scripture. Okay, so it's 9.06, 9.15. We will start again. In this second section, we're going, session, we're going to talk about the book of Revelation. And this is a very quick overview of Revelation because there's so much in this book. Uh, but I want to begin by go, going back to the map that we have here. And so you can see here that, again, the first century world. So, Nile, time bar. Okay. All right, so. Uh, this is the first century world and the world of Peter and Paul and, and the missionary journeys. <coughs> but we're going to look at another, another map here in a second. But if Peter was writing up there, John, is for, according to tradition, John spent most of his time in Ephesus. That's where he lived. And if you go to Ephesus today, <coughs> you can find... A house where Peter supposedly lived, or Peter's mother lived and died. Uh, but he was exiled for some unknown reason uh, out to an island over in this area. And it's called the island of Patmos. So let's look at that. So there, here again you see Ephesus, but Patmos is right down here. Okay, see that? And, and so, a few years ago, I had the privilege of going to visit uh, Ephesus and the island of Patmos. Uh, I, I showed you uh, some pictures of Ephesus earlier when we studied Ephesians. But now I'm just going to show you the island of Patmos. And today you can see it's just, it's just a lot of... Uh, of rocks and dryness with a, with a lot of sea surrounding it. Uh, there's my my son a number of years ago, Da G. <laughs> and then there he is climbing the rocks. And there is the top of the rocks. But unbelievably, we found a labyrinth on the ground. Now you. Now you know the labyrinth is the pattern we have in our in our chapel, but there someone else had built a labyrinth there. So of course my wife, who loves the labyrinth, who's published eight books on the labyrinth, was very very happy to walk the labyrinth, and we took pictures of her. Uh, well, actually we all walked before we were finished. But here's one more picture. This is the place that that was thought to be where John was imprisoned on the island. And so he's inside of this cave-like place that the church, the Orthodox Church in particular, well, I think it's the, this looks like an Orthodox uh, minister. I, I don't know really if the Catholic influence are on the island. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. But this, uh, this is a shrine type of place where they've turned it into a place of worship. And you can see the icons. I guess that pretty much convinces me that it's an orthodox uh, between the dress and the icons. And so you see behind there the, the, how it's set up for people to come in, to pray, and to just think about being where John wrote the book of Revelation. Okay, so that's just a few photos for you. But let's now took, look at the book. And let's start by reading Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, well done. All right. Um, so this is, of course, a very famous book. How many of you have read the book of Revelation? 
Raise your hand. Okay, almost everybody, good. How many of you have ever done a Bible study, uh, like at your church or somewhere else, on the book of Revelation? Only one, two people. Okay, so not many people, uh, but you've read it at least. So part of what I want you to see right away is how the author is approaching this letter and how he's uh, addressing the issue of persecution. Now, I, I already told you in the introductory lecture his approach to persecution, his belief about that persecution is inevitable. But what I want you to see here in the beginning is that he's trying to give the the reader is a great deal of confidence. He's in prison somewhere, or he's on the island of Patmos writing this letter, or writing, writing this uh, revelation. But he's writing with confidence. And the purpose, as far as I can tell, it, the chief purpose is to give confidence to the people who are reading it. Because just as he has suffered through exile, so they are suffering from persecution. And so they need encouragement, they need a vision, they need, they need words, they need a perspective, they need a theology that's going to help them in the midst of their suffering. That's what he gives them uh, in a very, very powerful way. And so he talks about, and so he introduces this as the revelation from Jesus Christ. So please don't call this the book of revelations, all right? You hear that all the time. Have you read Revelations? No, never, because there is no book called Revelations. It's, only, it's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's, in other words, what Jesus revealed to John, and John reveals it to us, or to his readers. And, and he talks about the blessing. And I want you to see that it's a prophecy, and it's a revelation, or apocalypse. Why, what's the difference? Prophecy is typically, as you learn this in Old Testament, I hope, is that, that a prophecy is a word of God for a present situation. And so in other words, it may be a word of judgment or it may be a word of hope, but it's something that addresses a current situation. Whereas apocalyptic literature is, deals more with angels and spirits and fire and heaven and hell and it's highly symbolic. And even though it uses the language of prophecy, it's a different genre. It's really intended to make a powerful impact on the reader to give them a sense of what's coming in the future. So prophecy and apocalypse can go together, but they're not identical genres. So we find in the book of Revelation, the first especially chapters 2 and 3, fit the prophecy genre best. He's writing to seven churches, historical churches. And he has a specific message for each one, for today, and for the near future. But then the rest of the book brings in an immense amount of apocalyptic imagery. And so in that sense we could say the, the, the genre uh, changes or, or is modified. All right, uh, again, there's, there's so much to say about the book of Revelation, uh, but I'm just trying to give you a, a, a quick overview of his intention and the nature of this book. Now, let's go to the notes. The key purpose is to issue judgment and offer hope, right? just in fitting with what you would expect from prophecy and from apocalyptic literature. <clears throat> One, John condemns idolatrous state practices. Two, John warns or encourages the Christians not to give in to the pressure to compromise, even though they were experiencing or were about to experience persecution. Three, John gives them hope that the future is, was firmly in God's hands. There was coming deliverance for them and judgment against blasphemers. And four, John reassures them that Christ... <coughs> Christ truly is coming back one day. And that's what we read that in these verses already. Now B, in contrast to Peter, the revelation like John's gospel responded to the persecution by especially focusing on the inevitability of persecution for the Christian. 
However, there was no instruction on how to avoid unnecessary persecution. Nor was the emphasis on winning the lost. All right, so those are two differences from 1 Peter. Peter wanted to be a good witness, and Peter wanted them to avoid unnecessary persecution. Those two things are absent in the Revelation. The thrust of Revelation was instead mostly on encouraging faith and faithfulness. All right? C, a pastoral letter with apocalyptic genre. Revelation in apocalyptic fashion is focused on the course of history, that is a relatively short span of history, which is called the end, or the end times. The eschaton. <coughs> and on the forces of evil in conflict with God and the forces of good. Unmistakably, the concern was a pastoral one in which comfort was offered to its readers by indicating that the present evils and those to come were not outside the control of God. The problems of the world came from A, God's acts of judgment on evil and idolatry, or B, Satan and the fallen angels over whom God would ultimately triumph. While Peter employs the apocalyptic terms Babylon for Rome in 513, Revelation goes into greater detail, painting a picture of evil at work. John describes principalities and powers in terms meant to draw the reader's attention to Rome and its emperor. The portrayal of the beast uttering blasphemies and calling for worship probably refers to Domitian. That was the emperor at, at the end of the first century. But however, Gordon Fee it says the beast from the sea is a standard image for a world empire. It's not necessarily for an individual ruler. So, in other words, we don't really know for sure who the beast is supposed to represent. Either it's a specific emperor or it's general for a kingdom of this world. We don't know for sure. Of greatest importance, Revelation makes unmistakable the belief that the end of all the conflict would be characterized by the ultimate and eternal victory of God over Satan, the beast, and his other servants. So God is going to be the winner. Even though in their experience they look around them and all they see is evil and persecution and suffering. So if they just trust their eyes, they think that all is lost. John is writing to say all is not lost. God is ultimately going to bring victory. That was his theology, his teaching. Uh, those who remain faithful, who do not worship the beast, will be among those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and will participate in the great wedding feast. The letter explains persecution and offers comfort, hope, and encouragement to remain faithful amid it all. D. Thus, Revelation was written to encourage Christians to remain steadfast in faithfulness and hope. Evil will be punished. Faith will be rewarded. History is in God's hands. So be sure you're on the right side. Okay? I think that's, that summarizes his message. So now let's talk a little bit about how to interpret the prophecies. There are four basic options for how to interpret the prophecies. You may have studied this in New Testament introduction. I don't know. Um, but if you did, this is a review for you. One view says everything that we read about in Revelation pertains to back then. This is called the preterist view. In fact, some people would say the, the prophecy that Christ would return again and set up his, his kingdom already took place. Christ is already reigning in his kingdom. It's already been fulfilled. Two, Revelation provides a map of Christian history or the history of the church. <coughs> That's the, the more or less a dispensationalist point of view. Some of you may have been taught that. You have the seven churches. Each one represents a different era. 
in history of humanity. How many of you were taught that in your church? Anybody? The seven churches were a different period in history? Anybody? No? Well, you're missing out. Uh, I don't think it's the right view, but it, it is interesting. Okay. Uh, third is predictive prophecy only about the end times. That's what we call the premillennial view. And you can read more about that in Gordon Fee's book, Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. So in other words, the book is really talking about everything that's going to happen before Christ returns, before he establishes his kingdom. And the fourth view is that everything is symbolic. In other words, it doesn't relate to specific historical events so much, maybe after chapters 2 and 3, but rather is a symbol of the great battle between good and evil. So, uh, how many of you heard sermons or teachings about Revelation in your church? Raise your hand. How many of you? Does your, do your, does your pastor teach on Revelation? One? Okay, so you don't know anything about Revelation, do you? You didn't preach about it, you didn't read, some of you read it, didn't study it. So it's, it's funny because in my culture, Revelation is such a big deal. I mean, people are so interested in it. Um, so, well, I'm going to ask you anyway, because I don't think you know the answer. Because you, you're telling me that nobody preached on it and you didn't study it. But of these four views, which one do you think is right? So how many of you think that everything that's written about in the book pertains to back then, the first century? Raise your hand. Nobody? How many think that it provides a map of Christian history for the last 2,000 years? Raise your hand. Uh, we got two, three. Okay, so see, some of you did hear that idea. Three, predictive prophecy only about the end times that haven't happened yet. How many think that's what it's about? Raise your hand. Three more. Okay, how many think that everything in the book really, or most everything in the book is really just symbolic? Raise your hand. Oh, that's the vast majority of you. Okay. Well, let me make some comments about the symbolic nature of the book and the prophecies. That's point B here in your guide. Many scholars do not believe specific predictive prophecies were intended to be fulfilled literally then or in some later time. Rather, they are word pictures or symbols of reality, not scripts. In other words, this, this book is not trying to say, this is going to happen, then that, then that, then that. You watch. It's going to happen just like this. That's a script. Others would say, no, it's, these are symbols that represent what happens in, in human history. So others hold to the belief that the prophetic word for John's day was set against the backdrop of eschatological events. In this view, the set of predictions will be fulfilled in history. So there, these people are looking for a beast. Who's the beast? When's the beast coming? When is the tribulation coming? How long will the tribulation last? If you hear questions like that, people are talking like that, that means they believe this book is to be interpreted literally, as a literal prophecy. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. There's two, two major views, four different views, but two major uh, different approaches. Thus, in the history of interpretation, Christian interpreters affirm that Revelation's prophecies will be fulfilled. But some say literally, some say figuratively. That's what I'm asking you to, as you, for this class, to think about which do you think it is. Because there's going to be a point where you may want to, to teach on this book in your church or, pre, or preach a sermon from it. And so you have to know which, which approach are you going to take. Thus, point two, thus, in my opinion, it is best not to try to figure out the prophecies. It's better to see the prophecies as part of a genre rather than specific foretelling of events. 
ask, what is the purpose behind these images? What is the rhetorical effect on the readers? Frank Matera says, the theological significance of Revelation is the prophetic call to worship God and bear witness to Jesus. Okay, so again, one more comment here I want to make about the difference of literal. Some people believe very strongly that this is to be interpreted literally. I grew up in a church like that. And I have, I used to have this chart with all of the details of Revelation on that chart mapped out. And I would study it and study it and study it. It's like, okay, this beast, this seal, this symbol, this judgment, this plague, all of these things. And it was impossible to fully understand, in my opinion. And I tried. My father used to go to a class for 13 weeks. They studied every single prophecy, trying to understand what is it saying? What are the signs? And I know that some people do that. But in my, ex my experience, in my effort to do that, it doesn't ever lead to a conclusion that I can, I can believe in. So, I, I'm just telling my, my conclusion. You may have a different one. My conclusion is, because I can't make sense of it all. Like it doesn't, all the pieces don't fit together so that I can understand them. Either God will explain it to me later, which could be a case, or it was never supposed to be interpreted literally. That's why we can't do it. Instead, it's supposed to be a symbol, symbolic of the great battle between good and evil in the world. Now, I want to I make a little pitch. Pitch is like an argument for the second view. An, another argument. I already made one. I find that sometimes I, I feel overwhelmed by the evil in the world. Does anybody else ever feel that way? Just, just this feeling like there's just so much darkness and evil in the world that it's, it's almost hopeless. Does, does anybody ever feel that? Raise your hand. Uh, just a couple of you. So the three of us should talk. Everybody else is dismissed. And the three of us will talk. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I don't want you to feel negative. I don't want you to feel hopeless. But, but I think there are times when, when we need to let in how bad it really is. And, if you, and if, you, if you don't know how to do that, go online and read the news. Find out what's happening in Syria, in Turkey, in Yemen, and Afghanistan, and Russia, and in uh, China, the people who are in political re-education camps. Read stories about what happened in Cambodia and Vietnam when the, when the communists took over. Things are, are much better in Vietnam today, but it was horrific for many years. Uh, think about your own history. Okay, this is, this is everywhere in the world. There are so many uh, people in power who use their power, who are corrupt, and use their power to oppress people. Why am I saying all this? Because that's, that's what the book of Revelation is talking about. He's talking to people who live in this reality. They know how bad things are. And so, he's trying to give them a message. Not trying, he does. He gives them a message of hope in the midst of their suffering. The classic liberal approach to the problems of the world is to believe that we can change the world. And I really do believe that everybody in this room hopes you can change the world. I really do. When you're in your 20s, you need to believe that. Because that is what motivates you to get out and do something. So, get out and do something. I mean, I really believe in that. But the big picture perspective of the world teaches us that there are many good things that we can do. And at the same time, there are these forces that are so much bigger than you and me. That are always at work, always churning out evil you know, and, and powerful forces to hold people down or to, to destroy people. 
it's everywhere. And so as I have, as I have grown out of my 20s and my optimistic um, optimism and idealism, and I'm approaching a much later stage in my life, and I've grappled with the, these forces of evil, I'm looking for another message of hope. How else can I find hope? God doesn't want us to live in despair. I don't believe that. That's the devil who wants you to be discouraged and to give up. But what is a message of hope that, that really can give me strength in the midst of all this darkness? Well, I think 1 Peter gives us a great message of hope. He tells us a lot, at least that encourages me. Revelation gives a more narrow message of hope, but it's still a message of hope. And let's read more about what are these timeless messages of hope. Okay, this is point number three. Or Roman numeral three. Number one, God has won the victory over evil through Jesus Christ. So you don't see it. You don't see it necessarily. But that's what he's saying is, this: if we look at, at the world through the eyes of faith, we must believe that God has won the victory through Christ. It's a matter of time. Maybe many thousands of years, we don't know. But it's a matter of time until that victory is seen in the world. Point number two, judgment is coming for evildoers. That gives you hope. So there's going to be justice. There's hope that, that the evil that was done to you will, will be accounted for. Three, there's a hope of a new heaven and a new earth. No more tears. Whether that's literal or figurative, it doesn't matter. Because the, the message is, our hope is, is in something God is going to create that you and I cannot create. See, that's the apocalyptic worldview. And that we see that in some of the books of the Old Testament, Daniel in particular, uh, but it's also here in Revelation. Four, you need to expect opposition, even persecution for faith. And so hold firm to your faith and to your witness in the midst of the persecution. Five, salvation depends upon faith and perseverance. That fits along with the writer of Hebrews and John Calvin's theology. Everyone is going to be judged by their works, but some are going to be saved if their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So those are the timeless messages behind the apocalyptic imagery for Christians that are found in the book of Revelation. You're going to have to decide what the main theological message of the New Testament is. Well, Christianity is known as the religion of love. Not that we always act lovingly, unfortunately, but theologically, it's the, it's the, it's the religion of love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors ourselves. John, in the Gospel, John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st John especially, and even in Revelation, love, love, love. Love is the chief mark of the Christian faith. So I take from that that it's my job, your job, to find out what that means. So I, my goal should be to try to experience the love of God in every way possible and to learn how to love God in every way possible and to learn how to love other people, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in every way possible and to learn how to love the world, who, some of whom may even try to persecute me or kill me. The, that has been the, the witness of the church over the centuries. Those who put love in the primary place those are the people we remember. Those are the people we honor. Those are the people who touch us. So you and I are called to be one of those people, including in Revelation with all of the fire and, and, this, and, the, and the plagues and all the disaster. We're still called to be people of love. Number two, God will not abandon those who are persecuted or who suffer unjustly. God is all-powerful and faithful and just. 
Let me tell you, when somebody is in prison or being tortured, they feel abandoned. They feel alone. That, that's, that's the intention of the persecutor, is to make the, the tortured person feel alone and abandoned. John writes and says, you must believe that you're not alone. Even if you feel alone, God will never leave you or forsake you. That's, that's Paul, but he's saying the same message. Three, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Uh, well, we saw that in John chapter 1, the Gospel, and it appears again here in John, the Revelation of John. <clears throat> and the Lamb of God, we talked about the significance of that. The Lamb of God conjures up the idea of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf for the forgiveness of sins. And that's why in John, one of the images he gives us is is the Lamb who was slain sitting on the throne in heaven or at the right hand of God. And four, final judgment is for everybody. Salvation is for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, we still have about five minutes, so what I want to do here is just talk to you about an important theological issue that's raised, especially in the book of Revelation. Is God just or is God loving? Is God just or is He loving? Both. Some of you think both. But this is extremely relevant not only to the interpretation of new, the New Testament, but also to what you're going to preach in the church. The churches that only emphasize forgiveness, salvation by grace through faith, they don't talk about works, they don't talk about righting wrongs. They're emphasizing God's love to the exclusion of God's justice. Those who emphasize works and earning salvation and, and, and our responsibility to change the world sometimes can, can come across very judgmental and superior to other people. And they, they emphasize the God of justice, but they don't emphasize enough the, of the God of love. So I gave you a, just a very short uh, two columns here, short depiction. If God is a God of judgment, if God is just, we're going to emphasize judgment, condemnation, punishment, and hell. And we can find that in the book of Revelation. We can find that in many books in the New Testament. That there is punishment for those who reject God, including fiery hell. Well, if you emphasize love, you're going to emphasize grace and forgiveness and merciful salvation in heaven. Well, I think if I asked you, which do you like better? Which one do you like better? God of justice or God of love? And I think love. But here's the funny thing. I think you, you and most everybody else, you like the God of love for yourself but you like the God of justice for everybody else. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about that. I think this is a false dichotomy. In other words, it's a false choice. I agree with those who say that God is both. So let me talk about that. John says, the prospect of God's justice actually offers hope to the persecuted. Salvation is for those whose names are written in the book of life. Though how one gets his or her name written in the book of life is not spelled out. He doesn't tell us. In the Old Covenant, it seemed based on righteous deeds. The same idea is present in the New Testament. But if our righteousness is something God provides rather than we earn, so Paul, then it is part of the gift. We look for signs of God's grace in the faith and belief that's within us. And we look for it by our perseverance in the midst of suffering and persecution. Now, note, human beings have a psychological need for justice. Yet what we really mean is that we want others to be held accountable more than we want to be held accountable ourselves. If we truly want and demand justice, then everyone must be held accountable, including you and me. In God's wisdom, the only way to meet the real or psychological need for justice and accountability is for each of us to stand before the judgment seat of God. And so that is what John teaches. 
since each one of us will be found to fall short of God's standards, then the only way to provide adequate consequences or punishment and to save us was to offer Christ as a sacrifice. To forgive without accountability minimizes the seriousness of our sin and frustrates the human yearning for justice. Now the concept of sacrificial atonement remains the predominant theological view expressed in both Old and New Testaments, even if there is a debate as to what exactly this means. Perhaps the idea of Christ paying the penalty for our sins is only one possible interpretation for the meaning of Christ's death. One that's helpful for those who quote unquote need such an interpretation to grasp the significance of their sin and the magnitude of God's sense of justice and love. We cannot say definitively, but can only do our best to discern the thinking of biblical writers and to reflect on the nature of God with the tools available to us. Here's one suggestion. We might say that Christ had to die because of our sins and to bring us salvation. So affirm that, yes, he had to die. But we could stay open to there being multiple reasons for his death, not just one. Some known to us and some unknown to us. Now in, lecture, in weeks 11 and 12 there's a lecture on soteriology and, and we'll talk more about that later. But, but I'm just proposing to you maybe a new way or hopefully a better way to think about atonement. You could still affirm that Jesus had to die, but be open to the possibility that it may not be for quite the reason you think. I personally don't think that God is in heaven and that he has to see blood dripping from God, Jesus' hands. And he looks down and says, all right, there's enough blood, I forgive you. I, I don't accept that. But I don't dismiss it either. And that's what too many people do, in my opinion. They say, oh, that's barbaric. I, that's too bloody. Forget it. God is a God of love. He can forgive who he wants. Let's forget that. No, I think that's a mistake. There's something very powerful about God sacrificing himself and the need for sacrifice because it teaches me sin is serious. Judgment is serious. God is serious about justice. I have to be serious too. And I need to humbly and gratefully submit myself to God and gratefully accept his forgiveness. There's nothing like seeing Christ on the cross to make that point for me. Without Christ on the cross, I think I might become a humanist. And I think, God's a God of love. I'm a, God of, I'm a person of love. Maybe I'm a God myself. And I'm just going to go and be a loving person and change the world. I don't think it works that way. All right, you think about it. And we'll, you have lots of time for your question, discussion after chapel. But now we have to go. We'll see you after chapel. Okay, so here uh, the question was, does love cover righteousness? But let, let's read the verse carefully. Let's start in verse 7. The end of all things is near. That, that's what Peter believed. He believed that the end was coming very quickly. Everybody in the New Testament believed that. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Excuse me. So, um, love doesn't cover over righteousness. It covers over unrighteousness. And so, what, what I believe that this means is if someone has sinned against you and you show love to them, what that does is that helps to mitigate or to lessen the power of their sin. In other words, you can make a situation better by forgiving people, being kind to people, helping people, even people who have hurt you. So that's one possible interpretation. Another possible interpretation is that it's your sins that are covered over. The idea of covering is the same idea uh, as atonement. 
Atonement was a cover. So when you cover sins or atone for sins, you are receiving forgiveness for sins. So a second possible interpretation of this is that by loving other people, we can atone for some of our sins. Uh, and so in other words, uh, in God's mind. I'm not sure which one it means here. Uh, but we can be clear about this. We're called to love. Love is a good thing. And love, love helps us because we as a community are affected by sin. My sin, your sin, we, it hurts our community. But as we show love to one another, that helps to cover over some of what we've, the damage we've done to each other. So I think we can say that much for sure. All right? And it may be that for that question, uh, go to one of the commentaries in the, in the library and see if there's a, you can get a fuller uh, explanation, more than I could give. All right, the next one. How can we relate the seven churches in Revelation to our present churches? I think the best way to do that, and let, let's just look at them quickly. That, that'd be Revelation 2 and 3. So here, for example, is to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, etc. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So first of all, he commends this church in Ephesus for their good qualities. These are the ways they're being faithful. And, but then, verse 4, he, he issues a word of prophecy against them. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. All right, so what does that message have to do with your church in the village? I don't know. Uh, you have to decide. If I were preaching on this passage, I would do it more as an exegetical study. First of all, I would say this is what John, the prophecy against or for and against this church. This was the warning. And then for the application, I would say, so let us think about our own church. What are our strengths here? Some of you are very hardworking. You're persevering in your faith. You volunteer your time. You're generous with your giving. I don't know what you'll say, but look for the qualities of your church. But then if you have a word of judgment, speak it. But one thing that we don't do well here at our church is... Welcome outsiders. Maybe we are too critical, we're too judgmental of one another. I don't know. You are the pastor. If you're the pastor, you have to watch. And then you could use this story or this passage as a historical study of affirmation and judgment. And then you can create your own message. Um, in between that... So one is historical, and then you create your own uh, message. In between those two options is to look for the specific messages in, in their situation, and then apply the ones to your situation that you think fit. And so I've heard several sermons about forsaking the love you had at first. And you could talk in your church about, what does it mean to forsake your first love? And what I think it means in this case is that they love Christ, they follow Christ, they gave their life to Christ, and yet over time, they, they gave their love to other things. Maybe to buildings, to people, or their other concerns. 
and they've fallen from the place where they love Jesus more than anybody else. So that would be a good message, good sermon. You could challenge them and say, do you still love Jesus as you did when you first gave your life to him, when you were first baptized? If you don't, consider how far you've fallen from that. Repent. Turn back. Renew your love for Jesus. See, that's how you could apply it. And every one of these is the same way. So there's a church in Smyrna. He, has, he talks about what's right and he talks about what's wrong. And, and, and that's the same pattern for all seven of the churches. But some of the things aren't going to apply. There are no Nicolaitans today. And here, verse 13, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Well, that, it doesn't necessarily apply to your village. So not everything can be applied. All right? Question number three. Does Revelation really speak to the Christian faith today? You know, that's a good question. And I think it fits with, this, with question two. <coughs> but remember what I said about the symbolic value of Revelation as a huge, as depicting this cosmic battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. Well, that still applies today. That's why I told you about my struggle with despair, my struggle with feeling overwhelmed with evil in the world. There are people that feel that way, people who are discouraged because of evil. Well, Revelation does have a message, and I, and I gave you those messages here. I gave you five messages under number three, timeless message behind the apocalyptic imagery for Christians. And so those five messages do apply to the Christian faith today. Does the gospel mission, sharing the gospel to others, marginalize their faith? This is a good question. I mean, they're all good questions. But what I'm thinking about is, when it comes to theology, and it comes to practical theology, and it comes to witness, we all have to identify a starting place. In intellectual language, we call that a presupposition. Do you know that word, presupposition? It's what you think before you even have a discussion. So if you think that the most important thing uh, where's Albert? Albert, wave your hand. Okay, I want to see your group over there. Okay. If you think that the most important thing is that we treat everybody equally, and that everybody is all, every, every message is equal, if, you, if that's your starting place, then yes, preaching the Christian message might marginalize or be judgmental to other people. And so you won't want to do it. But if your presupposition is that not every belief in the world is equal, not every belief is true. In fact, there are lies and de deception that Satan has sown seeds of, of deception in the world that have found their ways into different religions. And if you believe as a starting place that God has revealed his truth to us through Jesus Christ, then your answer will be different. Then your answer is no. You are not marginalizing those people. You are offering them hope. You are loving them by, by sharing with them a message that could transform them and give them life. So examine your presuppositions. And that is such an important question, uh, such an important point for your study here at MIT. And in my experience, most students are not taught to do this. So you go to one class and you hear what I think. You go to another class, you hear what he thinks. You go to another class, you hear what she thinks. So you collect all these ideas and you say, I don't know what to think. <laughs> so I'm trying to teach you how to think. And one of the ways you do that is you should always say, what are his presuppositions? What's his starting place? 
And if he's assuming, as I said before, all ways are equally true, well, that will lead to a different conclusion. If his starting place is the truth has been revealed in Jesus, that leads to a different place. Because ultimately, intellectually, you, you have presuppositions also. So first you need to identify, what are they? Name them. What do you consider self-evident truth? Rock solid truth. Because that's what you're starting from every time you hear a new idea. And then you need to evaluate your presuppositions. Maybe you have some presuppositions that, that, that if you think about it, you won't hold them anymore. Once upon a time, all the Christians in the world thought the world was flat. They just assumed the world was flat. So if somebody came along and said, you know, the world, the earth is really round. They said, no, you're wrong. You know, we, we're going to kill you because you, 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 you're, you're preaching heresy. Because they assumed, they knew that the world was flat before you even discussed it. And they, they assumed it because of some of the teaching in the Bible. They said, well, it sounds like the world's flat. But they would have been wrong. They were wrong. So think about your presuppositions. Examine them uh, in, in the course of doing your theology. All right. Are there two kinds of judgment and revelation? Yes, there are. Let's take a look at them. Let's get back to the Bible. Uh, revelation 20 and 21. So, Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. What is the abyss? The abyss is, is, is normally thought of as if the earth opens up and you go down, 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 down into the abyss from which there is no return. That's one image that, that, that we have of, of hell or, or the great abyss is where all those who reject God go. Right? So he had the key to the abyss. And he was holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. There are many ideas about what that means. Right now, I'm just trying to to give you an example of Revelation where there's the idea that one, Satan is not more powerful than God. If God sends an angel to bind up Satan, Satan cannot defeat God. That's why it's a message of hope. Because you, when you're suffering, sometimes you might think Satan is stronger than God. But he's not, John is saying. And so this, this language is saying there's a place of destruction or there's a place of imprisonment and the devil's going to be thrown into there and, and chained away for a time. All right, so then he goes on. He talks about thrones on which were seated those who have been given authority to judge. So here's this idea that the martyrs are going to be put on thrones to judge the people. And I saw the souls of those. We don't know who's on, actually, we don't know who's on these thrones. But we saw thrones and judges, I mean, at this point. So we saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony. Those are the martyrs. They had not worshipped the beast, etc. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right, that's the idea of the millennium. A millennium is a thousand years. So those who interpret this literally say there's going to be a thousand year period when this takes place. It says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So that gives the idea that there's a judgment where the, those who have been martyred for their faith will come to life, reign with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead stay dead until after this time. So he calls this the first resurrection. All right, then he goes on. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released. He'll go out to deceive the nations again. Again, the question is, is this symbolic? Does he mean literally? Are we in that thousand year period now? 
Is it going to be in the future? We don't know. These are the questions that exegetes ask of the text, but it's impossible to answer because we can't see it in history. Some people say yes, we can. Some people say no. So it's very difficult. So that's why some people say, this is just imagery. Or some people say, someday we're going to know what this means. We'll look back and we'll say, oh, that's what it means. Just like the prophecies about Jesus. Right? When, when those prophecies about Jesus were written in the Old Testament, I don't think people knew that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. They didn't really understand the suffering servant would point to Jesus. They didn't. They, they knew it was a prophecy, but they could not imagine its fulfillment. It was only after the fulfillment that they had eyes to look back and see the connection. So some people say, that's what's going to happen with Revelation. You and I read it, we think, scratch our heads, we go, I, I don't really understand. But someday we will look back. I think that's a possibility. Uh, so then... But in the language of Revelation, it says there's going to be this huge fight. But, so all these people were gathered together like sand on the seashore, following the devil to, to fight against God's people. That's what Revelation is teaching. But look what happens. Do the, do the people of God defeat Satan? Did you know? Do you remember? Do we, do we who are faithful rise up and we defeat the enemies of God? No. But look at this. Uh, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So who's going to defeat the enemies of God? God is going to. This is very typical of apocalyptic literature. It's not... The, the Old Testament idea of the... Of, of, of the kingdom of God, the Messiah, the political Messiah, such as David and Solomon, the idea there was that a human being would rise up and rule the people as an agent of God or son of God and would bring peace and stability to the nation. But the, there's a different strand of thinking called apocalyptic literature that says that's not going to happen. Instead, the, the powers of evil will rise up against the people of God, but God himself will send someone or fire to defeat the enemy. Two different ideas. And that's why sometimes there's, there are different interpretations in the New Testament. But this, in Revelation, is the apocalyptic idea. God is going to defeat them. Um, and so, but then they will be tormented day and night forever. All right? So, how are we doing? Okay, so there's the idea of eternal hell, eternal punishment. 2011, I, then I saw a great white throne and him seated, who was seated on it. So now it's not martyrs on the throne, it's not people, it's, it's God sitting on the throne. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And so here, it's this verse that makes me think that everyone is going to be judged by their deeds. But there are two books. One is a book for... For, for everyone. And then there's another book, a book of life. Well, if you read about the book of life from the Old Testament, and I put, I put those references in your guide for you to look up if you want to. The book of life is reserved for those people that God has chosen. He's elected. Those are the people to whom God will give salvation. So that, I hope, explains to you the confusion you had that led to your question. Everyone is judged. I believe everyone is condemned because of their, their lack of works. No one's going to stand. Somebody does no works. Somebody does a few works. Some do many works. But everybody falls short of the glory of God. Everybody deserves judgment. But by God's grace, by God's wisdom, some of those people 
their names are also in this book of life. And so my understanding of this text is that if by God's grace your name is in the book of life, you will be saved. Not because of works, because you can't be. Nobody will be. But you will be judged. That's God's justice. So you still need to do good works. You're still going to be, you're still going to be accountable for your deeds. But in the end, salvation depends not on your works, but on whether or not your, your name is in the book of life. All right, so more, but we have to keep going. So, but Revelation 20, and then you can keep reading 21, is where most of the talk about final judgment is. Are the symbols, prophecies, and teaching of Revelation appropriate to every circumstance of Christians today? I don't think so. But the main message is, and that's, I'll refer you again to these five timeless messages. You could preach on those messages over and over again. Should we remain silent as chosen people amid injustice in this country? That is a really good question. That question, I believe, can only be answered through a process of discernment. And what I mean by that is you and the leaders of your church and your community need to pray and to decide is God calling us to protest or not? Is God calling, calling us to resist non-violently or not? Is God calling us to resist in violently or not? These are the kinds of questions Christians have had to answer for 2,000 years. Most often, Christians choose not to speak up. Most often, Christians have chosen to endure suffering because the focus is on their Christian witness and their desire to show by their behavior and their consistency that they are followers of God and their witness is what's going to change society. It's not their fighting against the, the other power. Once you start to fight against evil, then you start, you're using their weapons. And when we fight against evil using the weapons of evil, we will probably be drawn into evil ourselves. How many of you have ever seen uh, Star Wars, the movie? Anyone? Oh, some of you. It's such a great movie. But they always talk about the forces, the, the dark forces, right? And, and when Luke Skywalker is learning about how to draw on the powers of, of the light, the powers of the force, may the force be with you, he's always warned about the dark side. Because if he responds out of rage and anger and violence and hatred, it's going to draw on the dark side, and the dark side is going to overcome him, like his father, who became Darth Vader, right? Everybody needs to see these movies, okay? Uh, because they're symbolic about this battle of good and evil. And the danger always for those people who think they're people of the light is to draw on the darkness within them to fight the darkness. And that's a mistake. But having said that, history is also full of times of Christians who stand up and they fight, they defend themselves. Okay, there's, and that's, most Christians have concluded that defending yourself, that's not revolution, but defending yourself is legitimate. Or nonviolent resistance, like Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States is an example of nonviolent resistance. And sometimes that can produce good results. But I have to tell you that, I have to point out that Martin Luther King Jr. used nonviolent resistance against a predominantly Christian society. So they already had the values of justice and righteousness. They weren't following them, but the nonviolent resistance exposed their hypocrisy. And they knew it. Well, what if you're standing up against people who don't care about human rights? They don't care about justice. Then they might just kill you. So I don't know. Do you see why I think this is a not, there's no easy answer. 
You have to think about it, pray about it. But please, don't draw in darkness to fight darkness. It will consume you. Last question. Is a message of hope the best message for those who are marginalized? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. What other message could we give them? Hopelessness? No. Uh, we, could, we could tell them, I mean, we have to know what the right message of hope is. You see, every political group, every religious group, offers a message of hope. What do Buddhists offer? The hope of freedom from suffering. They're offering hope. What did the communists offer? Have you studied communism? All right, so study how they've really affected Russia and China and Vietnam and Cambodia. And then you'll know the truth. Because they're offering great hope to the suffering workers. Let's rise up, let's overthrow the, the oppressor. And let's establish freedom and independence. Because that's the greatest good. There's nothing greater than freedom and independence. But what happened? In every single communist country, they overthrew the, the ruling party and then they took away freedom and independence from the people. It was a big lie. It was a big lie. I don't know if they believed it or not, but it turned out to be a big lie. So my point is, every system holds out hope to the people. So yes, is the message of hope the best message? But the question you have to answer beneath that is, what is true hope? What brings true hope? Is it, say, communism? Socialism? Is it humanism? Is it uh, equality of human rights? Is it, is it Christianity? Is it Buddhism? Is it, is it my effort? Is it a savior? You see, there are many different options. My belief is that for you to become educated theologically, you should learn what every one of these systems offers as hope and, and why they think it's, it's hope. That, that's what it means to me for you to be educated. You don't have to be an expert at every one of these philosophies. That's too much. But at least know briefly what is the hope of Buddhism? What is the hope of Confucianism? What is the hope of Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, Christianity? You should know that. And then you need to know where are you putting your faith? Why are you putting your faith in Jesus and the message of the New Testament? Or if you've picked one of the others, why did you pick that one and why did you reject the message of the New Testament? Alright, so that's point one. Know the different options. Know the source of hope. Evaluate the different messages. But then the other message it's really not number two, it's really number one for this class. Please, do the work this semester to understand what is really the message of hope here. That's been my concern that I talk about almost every week. Is that the message of Christianity is being changed by some of the advocates of theology and, and Christianity today. So that, so that mission is no longer gospel mission, preaching the gospel, but it's social action. Do you understand what you're, you're doing by doing that? You're saying the hope for the world is social action. That's what you're saying. Do you believe that? Is that really what's going to change the world? Well, I think social action will help. But that's not what the Bible teaches as the real source of hope. They say a real source of hope is in what God does, not what we do. God does through us, okay. But it's what God does. And in order for God to work through us, most effectively, we need to have a relationship with God. In order to have a relationship with God, we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's the message of the New Testament over and over again. So be careful. As you're forming your theology, don't accept another message of hope Unless you know what you're doing. Unless you consciously say, no, I, I don't believe this is the message of hope anymore. I believe that that was the first century and now I believe in a new message. Alright? Well, have the courage to say that if that's what you believe. 
But don't believe it if, if you're not thinking and you don't know what you're doing. So that's what I'm trying to do in this class, to make sure you know what the New Testament teaches, what the source of hope is, so that I hope you can make a more intelligent decision about what you're, what you're going to believe and what you're going to offer to other people. So is Revelation of 1 Peter relevant today? Absolutely. But you have to theologize. You have to contextualize. But it's still very relevant. Okay, my dear students, it's time to close the class. So let, receive the benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with hope and show you the true hope that there is for everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. May he fill you with hope, guide you by hope, and show you how you may offer hope to others in many, many ways. Amen. Amen.